Welcome back to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast, where you'll find information on what's going on on the North Fork of Long Island. We'll be focusing on issues and opportunities going on in the community, as well as people and stories from the present and the past. I'm your host, Christopher Bianchi, and our guest today is Peggy Lauber. She has been living out on the North Fork for quite a while now, and we discuss how she made her way out here, as well as getting involved in the wine industry and eventually becoming president of the North Fork Audubon Society. I want to thank you for listening to episode six with Peggy Lauber. Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. So just to start off in the beginning, could you give us just a little background about yourself and where you grew up? Sure. Um, I was born in Highland Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago on the shore of Lake Michigan. And I currently am a wine salesperson for Frederick Wildman and Sons, which is a wine importer and distributor based in New York. And that's what I do for a living. And as a volunteer, I'm president of North Fork Audubon Society, which is a local chapter of National Audubon Society. Nice. So how... How did you decide to move to the North Fork? You you grew up in Chicago? I, well, I grew up in Chicago, um, and I had a wonderful childhood there. My my I'm filled with walks in the woods and exploring the ravines and the, the beach there. Um, and I think this influenced me later in life, um, even though I, I went away to college. And after college, I, I moved to New York. But I think I was very fortunate to have that connection to nature, that a lot of kids today don't get to experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we had so much freedom then. Um, So uh, as much as I loved the woods, I I still had this dream to live in New York City, so I moved there right after college. Mm -hmm. So um, I was living in the city, and I got a job working in publishing in the PR and the marketing department of Travel and Leisure magazine. This was in the 70s. And that's where I first heard about the North Fork. I remember my boss, Jill Jolie, um, she would talk about how her father loved to fish and he would go to the North Fork and stay at the Soundview Inn. (laughs) And I was very intrigued. Um, I had never heard of the North Fork. I knew about the Hamptons. Um, But anyway, uh, one summer, my first husband and I decided that we would rent a house for the summer. He worked in advertising in the city and, you know, people went to the Hamptons. Um, But having you know heard what Jill was saying I suggested that we try the North Fork and then just coincidentally a friend of my husband's boss um, he was the minister of the Unitarian Church on Central Park West I I remember that Uh, he was renting his house which was right on the bay in Peconic this was 1979 and so we had this wonderful summer out there and then a year later we we came back and we kind of a spur of the moment decision. We bought a house in Orient. And then for years, it was a weekend getaway for us. Wow. So So you kind of found out about the North Fork based off of this travel and leisure mag- magazine? It had nothing to do with the magazine. It was just my boss who worked. She, she you know, we worked together and she was yeah. just telling me about, <laughs> about it. And I was like, oh, that sounds, that sounds lovely. You know, <laughs> I liked it, already liked it better than the Hamptons. And it wasn't too expensive at that time. Oh gosh, no. So how did you get, you you moved out to Orient and then you eventually got involved in wine yes. making? Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, first of all, like I'm not a wine maker. My career <laughs> began when I was 18 because I always loved wine. Um, um, actually, my father was an amateur winemaker, but his wine was undrinkable but um (laughs) but even in college i went to college in new york state where the drinking age at the time was 18 and i loved to cook and pair wine with food then i would have my friends over for dinner and we'd drink wine so i just was a wine lover Um, but then as we were spending time on the north fork i saw the vineyards and i you know sort of looked around i was like wow at the time it was basically hargrave christina and pindar were the Mm -hmm. vineyards i remember then and then our fortunes, our personal fortunes changed when my, my husband, he sold his advertising agency and um, we had some money, and but we knew that we were going to have to make a choice. We weren't going to be able to afford to live in New York and to live out 
Mm -hmm. here as well, like something was going to have to go. So after some soul searching, we said, you know, the hell with the city. <laughs> we're going to try to make a go of it out in Orient. We didn't know what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. So we thought about, you know, okay, well, let's start a business. So my husband had some interesting ideas. One of them was take out taxi, which was <laughs> actually did it's, I guess there are these kind of services now, but he had this idea that we would, would go to all the restaurants and we would get their menus and we would like, people could order from their houses and we would deliver the food oh, to them. It's basically a delivery kind service. Kind of like, a, like Uber Eats. Kind of like Uber Eats now, but of course, you know, no <laughs> cell phones then, no Uber then. Not, yeah, anyway, so uh, I was like, um, no. And then he said, well, let's like start a deli. And I was like, oh, no. Um, so <laughs> so then, I said, then I said, I know this is a crazy idea, but why don't we buy a vineyard? Let's mm -hmm. like, look, I mean, like, look what's around us, these beautiful farmland and you know vineyards and at the time of course this is 1992 and um you know vineyards were not very expensive then or very much in demand yeah. so there was one on the market and um we thought it was too much money the development rights were sold um but even then we kind of i wanted to do it and he's a little hesitant the deal you know somebody else made an offer on it and then lo and behold, like six months later, that deal fell through. And I was like, come on, it's now or never. Let's do it. So now it's 1993. So we bought this vineyard. It was in South Hold. It was a working vineyard. They supplied uh, grapes for uh, a, a winery on the South Fork, at Bridgehampton Winery, now defunct. And um, they might have sold to Lens at the time as well. But anyway, uh, we decided to do our own label and and market our own wine and we called it Cory Creek Vineyards uh -huh. because yes. there were two creeks near the vineyard one was called Richmond Creek and we just liked the name Cory Creek better so we think <laughs> that these wow. are to spell and all that so um <laughs> so we started Cory Creek and we never actually had a winery there there was a potato barn which we uh, ended up turning into a tasting room uh, with the help of a, a neighbor and friend, Elizabeth Thompson. She was the architect. And we decided to just contract out for the winemaking, which was kind of unusual then. And, and this was before um, premium wine mm -hmm. uh, wine facility there in, in Mattituck. So there wasn't such a thing as a custom crush facility. So we partnered with um, the winemaker from Palmer Vineyards, Dan Kleck, and also Russ Hearn, from, who was at Pellegrini at the time, and they made wine for us. And, um, and then, and as we were getting it going, I also became partners in a gym in Greenport called Greenport Physique, which is next mm -hmm. to Mr. Roberts, which is now going to be the yoga and Pilates studio yes, soon to yes. open, you know, so, which it was also originally the bowling alley in the sixties. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, more, more about that later. But, um, so that's kind of how we, we started doing it. So because we had the winemakers making the wine i mean i would work with them on the blends and all that but they were the winemakers i was basically selling and marketing the wine and that's what i've done and that's what i started doing then and that's what i've been doing all these years is selling and marketing wine wow and you said when you were looking at getting the property there were were there three other wineries on the oh, okay. so at the time um in 1993 we we joined the long island wine council because now we were mm -hmm. officially vineyard owners and there were only 12 wineries then there were 12 uh and so we we were working together as a group um to get people to take our wines seriously that mm -hmm. was our mission that was the wine council getting people to know a that long island wine existed mm -hmm. and that it was good yes so um i think that the i think they still struggle with this today to be honest it's it's not been an easy road um some of the other issues that we faced were whether to allow winemakers who didn't own vineyards to join um, because as i said at the time there were there was no custom crush facility but there were some young winemakers that wanted to, to wanted to get involved and they were going to buy fruit from mm -hmm. existing vineyards and, and and try to make their own wine I guess yeah. early what we call garage yeasts now, but um, probably <laughs> didn't have that that name then. Um, so, and then th at that time, there were members that were adamantly opposed, like, no, 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 you have to own land. You can't just join the wine council. Well, we were totally 
disagreed with that. We said, come on, we, we have to be inclusive here. We've got to mm-hmm. get younger people involved. We've got to, you know, in the future, you know, we want to grow. We want to encourage people to become involved. We don't want to discourage them. Yes. Um, so, you know, fortunately, that, yeah, it has gone in that direction, I think. And you said there was a potato barn or what, what would you say? Yeah, well, our, our particular vineyard, ha- it had been... At some point. At some point, a know, potato. potatoes thing, whatever it was. It wasn't grapes. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a barn. So we just converted that into what is now mm-hmm. the Cory Creek Tap Room. Of course, we didn't do tap wines then. Um, but yeah, yes. we designed and built that. And it hasn't really, that whole, that hasn't really changed that much, that structure. I always say it had the best view on the North <laughs> Fork. I love that. When you had to do, because you said you don't really, you, you hired people to do the winemaking mm-hmm. process and you did more of the marketing and mm-hmm. how is it for for advertising and getting people to come out here mm-hmm. was there a little bit of kind of like oh that's not well that again was the you know the job of the wine council you yes. know, working together we we felt obviously it was important to work together to develop the wine trail had already existed there already was a wine trail thanks to rich olson harvick oh, okay who had gotten that through um i think it was him um and so there was a wine trail. So we were so part of the marketing, of course, was just you know, advertising, and doing endless trade tastings in the city. Mm-hmm. And for me, it was just one on one, going to see customers. I would go to see stores and restaurants. Mm-hmm. I would heavily uh, work in New York City because we felt that one great advantage that we had and and that the region still has is the proximity to New York City, which is one of the biggest wine markets mm-hmm. in the world, yes. maybe next to London. And so um, I was sort of a per- had a personal crusade to you know go in and, and introduce our wines to as many restaurants and stores as possible, and we were very successful at the time. You know, I remember we got into like Union Square Cafe. That was a big coup for us to you know to get because again, it took people, you know, the buyers in the city, the sommeliers, to have an open mind to say, oh well, oh, all right, we'll try Long Island wine. Yeah, that wasn't a given in those days. Mm-hmm. It was much more like, oh, if it would be like more of a snobbery thing to say, or mm-hmm. just like, oh, we're not going to try Long Island wines. There's a yeah reputation <laughs> that we just, yes. we're going to get stuff from somewhere else. Yeah. But I could write a book. Maybe I'll write a book someday. <laughs> um, but I mean, I can remember one in particular. I remember calling one buyer to try to make an appointment. I call him and I said, he said, hello. And I said, hi, um, this is. Peggy Lauber, I, um, you know, I have, I, I, I have Cory Creek Vineyards, and I'd like to show you some wine from our vineyard on Long Island. And he just goes, "Oh, no, thank you, dear." And he hung, he hung up on me. I was like, "Oh, no, thank you, dear." You know, that was the end of that. Um, so I did have, you know, had yes. doors slammed in my face, almost literally, um, but also many successes. So you know, I can't complain. Yes. Many, many successes. So it was a. It was a it was a good it was a good time, mm-hmm. and we did well. Unfortunately, our marriage was not doing so well, so that you know became an issue. So yes. we couldn't continue to, you know, and, and we felt that at that point we needed to bring in investors to you know do more of what we wanted to do, and that certainly wasn't going to happen. So then it was uh, 1999, and I was approached by I got this phone call, um, and I. You know, I, somebody was going to call me. I should take this call. And he said, "Hi, this is Michael Lynn." I'm like, "Michael Lynn?" Turns out, Michael Lynn was the CEO of New Line Cinema. They were just about to release the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so it was oh, like wow. on the cusp of you know, very, very big, very big time for them. And he had been interested in buying a vineyard. He had a house in East Hampton, and he was interested in maybe investing out in Napa, and he had a partner who, uh, Dave Socklin, who suggested that instead he invest on the North Fork. So they approached me, I knew Dave, and so Michael called and, you know, said, I, I want to buy your vineyard. So long story short, eventually we, after some wrangling with my husband who didn't want to give it up, um, we agreed that it was the best course of action. So we sold it to Michael, and Michael then, uh, a year later, he bought Bedell, and then he bought Wells Road Vineyards, which the family owns to this day. Um, Michael passed away, as you know, a few years ago. Yes. But um, but I worked, I stayed on for five or six more years and worked for Michael 
um, managing all the three properties and, and selling and marketing their wines. And then after that, um, I went to work for Christian Wolfer on the South Fork for nine more years. And so I had a very interesting experience. I worked for, I think, two of the most interesting winery owners in the region have many stories to tell. They were both larger than, than life. Um, <laughs> Michael was a perfectionist and he had his modern art collection. He was very, you know, uh, yeah, he was, <laughs> he was a interesting guy and obviously had a very, 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 very exciting job. Um, and, uh, and Christian, who was German, he, he loved horses. He had the stables there. It was just a beautiful property. He loved, loved life, loved to party. His life ended too soon. Um, but it was just a you know, great experience working for them both. And I learned so much more having those experiences. Um, wow. you know, so it took me to another level. Um, yes. And then for the last eight, well, this will be my eighth years, Eighth year, I oh, and during that time, I mean, gosh, I got to travel the world. I was on the board of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for a while. I was on their export committee, so I got to go to uh, big wine fairs um, all over the world. And and uh, and then now in my current job, I get to travel as well because I sell wines from all over the world. So, uh, so the you know the wine business has really afforded me a window to a life where I can have it all. I can live on the North Fork and, and have this wonderful rural experience, and yet I and can travel, travel and, and, yeah, and, and, and drink great wine all the time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, and alcohol is a very strictly regulated business, so I'm, I'm like the middleman. Yes. I thought it would be interesting. I, I, this was like a 4 a.m. thought, because <clears throat> nobody really understands. When they hear I'm in the wine business, Mm -hmm. And I live in Greenport. They naturally assume I'm in the Long Island wine business, which I was, but I'm not really anymore, other than I do sell uh, one of the many wines that we have in our portfolio is Sparkling Point in Southold, which is a terrific property yes. to sell. But I also sell these wines from all over the world. So I brought a few that I thought <laughs> I'd just show you. You're sure. welcome to taste them too. That happened to be open because I did a tasting over the weekend, just to give you an idea. So, I mean, I have... Wine from South Africa. This is Klein oh, wow. Constantia. I sell um, Ridge Ridge Vineyards from Paso Robles in California. Wow. And I have many Barolos in our portfolio. This is we're a big um, uh, distributor of some of the top Barolos from Piedmont, Italy. Mm -hmm. We have many Italian wines. I have one from uh, Puglia here. This is a Primitivo, and and then, oh, Burgundy. I mean, yes. we are like huge, uh, well, not huge, because <laughs> all Burgundy properties are very small, but we, we import, um, this is Domaine Humbert, we, we, we import a lot of wines from Burgundy. And I have one from Willamette Valley, which has a lot in common with Long Island. This is Solena from Willamette Valley. This is a Pinot Gris. Um, so... Um, Willamette, people say, a lot, of, a lot of the argument that, you know, you mentioned the snobbery before, people will say, well, Long Island wines, you know, Long Island, it's, it's a young, it's kind of a young region. Well, it's really not <laughs> so young. It was started in 1973, as we all know, yeah. by Louisa Hargrave. Guess when Willamette Valley, when the first vineyards were planted there? 1973, basically. Mm -hmm. Same age. No one ever mm -hmm. says that about Oregon. They don't say, oh, gosh, Oregon, it's a, it's a young region. No, they say Oregon. Oh, it's known for its Pinot Noir. So, but that was around the exact, like you said, the same time. Yeah. What about in yeah. parts of California? Are those older vineyards? Oh, yes. Yeah, there's, there's many uh, vineyards in California. Uh, Ridge was started in the 60s. Um, but many were started in like the late 1800s. Um, you know, so there's a lot of older, you can find older vines, you can find properties that have uh, grapes that are over 100 years old. Yes. So, but then, but, but this being said, the bulk of many, uh, of most wines sold all over the world are maybe more like 30 years old because at a certain point, the vineyard, the, the grapes, um, the yields go down so much. When you have older mm -hmm. vines, the yields are so low that they're very, very not profitable yes. to sell and, and they quite often need to be replanted. Mm -hmm. So um, you have vines can be ready to produce like three to five years. You can make wine out of them. Those are mm -hmm. young vines. But then you have many that are 15, 20, 25, 30 years. That's, that's very common. So we're not 
a young region as far as the age of our yeah. vines at all. So, so, so yeah, if someone says that, then they yeah, just... this is this is not true. <laughs> and so. um. And what about the soil for the region? Is is there? Uh, well, it, it's very similar to Bordeaux. By the way, I also sell lots of Bordeaux. It's one of my favorite uh, regions to sell uh, beautiful wines and actually pretty good. You wouldn't think so, but actually there's some very good values in Bordeaux. But the soil and climate are very similar because it's sandy loam clay soil. It's a maritime climate here. Mm -hmm. And even though we're on the same latitude as Madrid, were more like the temperatures are more like Bordeaux. So we have, and then, you know, we also have some of the same issues that you have in regions like Bordeaux and Burgundy, where you can have a rainy vintage or you can have an early frost or, you know, things mm -hmm. can, things can go wrong too. But that's, you know, these are our region, what it has in common with many old world regions is cooler climate. Cool, it's a cooler climate region, which a lot of people don't appreciate in the U.S. because they think, oh, well, if it's an American wine, that it must be like California. Well, most vineyards in California, not all, but most regions in California are like a warmer climate. So the wines are gonna be a little bit higher in alcohol. It's a, it's a different profile. It's a different profile than it's gonna be here in New York. Our right. wines are gonna have maybe more in common with old world regions like Bordeaux than they do with California. And a lot of people don't understand that. So they expect when they try a Merlot from Long Island, they think, Oh, well, this, you know, it's, this isn't very, they think it's very lean and maybe they, they'll say, oh, it's acidic because they don't really understand that these are food wines and you want that acid to go with, with food. So now how many wineries are there on the North Fork? Like 56, like 50, I think now. So starting yeah, yeah. in like, it was more in the teens. Yeah. When you started now, there's over 50. How has it changed on the North Fork for Winery. Well, I think, you know, what we've seen over the years is the development of the tasting rooms as wedding venues, you know, which are mm -hmm. necessary for the survival of so many wineries. They would not be able to, because of the cost of land and labor and all that, a lot of the wineries out here just would not be able to survive. Um, and that was another thing that we had talked about back in the early 90s. We were talking about, should we charge for tastings? Well, how could you not charge? Can you imagine not yeah. charging for tastings today? People would just come and, <laughs> I mean, they would just drink every last drop of wine that everybody made and there would, no one would, you know, it would be like, it would become a charity. Um, so, so that's, so that's, that's changed. And there's just, there's so many more. Um, and, and, you know, people, everyone is appreciative, I think, of, of the fact that wineries have helped stop development but you know because thank mm -hmm. god there's vineyards and not development but also it was that two percent transfer tax you know that has saved like i forget how many thousands of acres of land and and and, and organizations like the peconic land trust you know mm -hmm. thank god for them um and i think we should all appreciate how all that has worked you know to save the east end from looking like so many other places that mm -hmm. we know and might go shopping at but don't want to have in our backyard you know yes um and switching from wine to you living out here when you mm -hmm. moved out here, how has the North Fork changed separately from the winery industry? Well, um, you know, I said I would come back to working at Greenport Physique because I think, you know, be, being a partner there um, in the 90s, I got to meet like so many, so many people would come and, and work out in our, we had a gym in the back and we would have exercise classes. We were ahead of our time. We couldn't possibly survive financially because in the winter we would just die. There was no mm -hmm. business. But anyway, so, I mean, that's one thing. It was, you know, really, really hard then to have any kind of business that could survive year round. Mm -hmm. And it's still difficult. Yes. Um, but, and, and Orient is like just a very special place. I was so fortunate to live there. I just love Orient. And, mm -hmm. and you know that has really maintained its rural character but um and and all this was before the development of mitchell park which is a great example of how you know there's been change for the better mm -hmm. in the north fork but the other thing that's happened and it was inevitable is that you know the north fork has been discovered you know yes. um and so there's just more people but what i see and because i i work in the hamptons and the north fork that's where i work now is all over the hamptons and the north fork so i what we have here is just such a solid core of year rounders that our, our, I think mm -hmm. our culture is more entrenched. We have more ethnic diversity and we've hung on, we've been able to hang on to that. And, and I think that 
you know, we've been able to avoid the, you know, McMansion problem that they have over in the Hamptons. You yes, know, we're just, definitely. oh my God, you know, I just see what goes on there. It's just, you know, sickening to mm -hmm. see um, the way houses are overbuilt and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the resources are wasted and the, you know, all the bulkheads and the, you know, it just, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's and a shame. it's empty for a lot of and them. it's empty so much of the year. Yes. So it just you know thank God we have so much more of a year round population here, and I think that's really says I think we've been able to kind of hang on to our authenticity here, yeah. even though our fishing industry struggles and you know our, a lot of our local industries that were here historically struggle. Um, at least you know we're all getting by and and. And it's you know and it's appreciative. When I work on the South Fork, I have to say I'm always thank you know thank goodness they're there because that's you know, <laughs> good for my business. But I'm always happy to come back to the north, come home. Def def definitely. <laughs> so you're also the president of the North Fork Audubon Society. Yes. Um, could you give us a little introduction on the society sure. and? Sure. Um, so and, and my involvement in it i mean i was not a birder when i was a kid but i as i said i always loved outdoors and nature and and luckily you know was exposed to it and i had that connection and my my second husband paul same thing he grew up here in mattituck and um you know we both had we think ideal childhoods because we had so much freedom to mm -hmm. be out there in the woods and so of course we always you know continued in fact for our honeymoon we we went on a two-week trip to Panama and um, out into the jungle, and and we and it was a birding expedition. And we really didn't consider ourselves "quote unquote" birders. We just loved birds and nature. We thought, well, that sounded pretty cool. So we really loved that, and um, you know, we really started to get just sort of more tuned in, I guess, when we came back. Um, even though I wasn't involved with Audubon at the time. Um, you know, we just would go out in the woods all the time and look at birds. And then we would start, uh, we would run into George Rosum. George Rosum, who um, was the owner of Preston's, his family, his wife's family. Um, and, but he was a lifelong birder and he was a, had a license to, to do bird banding. And, um, he would be out in the woods, especially in during spring and fall migration, because we're on the Atlantic, North Atlantic Flyway here, so we have a lot of birds traveling through in the spring and the fall, especially. And he would set up these mist nets, and he would, um, tr you know, take careful notes and do research on all the birds that he would, you know, very carefully uh, examine them, and then of course let them loose again unharmed. And we were just became so enamored and just love, we would just look forward to like a Sunday morning, like maybe we'll see George, you know, <laughs> and we would, and we would be rewarded by, you know, he would, you know, show us what he was doing. And we just, he, he was a wonderful man. And he would, seeing our interest, he said, you know, well, actually North Fork Audubon is having a program. I remember one time he said, um, there's going to be a really great program this Friday night with John Turner. Well, I didn't know who John Turner was. Well, he's a pretty legendary birder out here as it turns out so that's kind of how we got involved it was thanks to George um, and um, so we started going to the programs and one thing led to another and uh, you know at the time of course you know people thought of Audubon as like you know sort of a birding club and it was a small group and they were just really needed help and, and, mm -hmm. and the, the irony is that their headquarters are at the Red House which is now called the Roy Latham Nature Center. We renamed it a few years ago. Um, but the Red House is where the original Long Island Wine Council offices were as well. So, oh, I, wow. <laughs> so as I was, sort of came back home again because I used to go to <laughs> meetings there for Long Island Wine Council. They used to share the space. But, um, but now it's just Audubon. But anyway, so I got involved and I joined the board and I don't know how many years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, and got involved in the programs and... Um, and, and the next thing you know, um, I'm, I'm here. I am president, <laughs> and uh, never thought, you know, never thought that would that this would evolve into this. But um, it's a wonderful organization. So definitely, yeah. And and we, I feel like we've really um, we've really grown. Um, we have it, it, we had until last month we had an all woman board, which is pretty incredible. We had like mm -hmm. nine women on our board, real go getters, <laughs> fantastic group of women. Now we've allowed one man. Actually, we've been trying to get men involved, but 
we <laughs> finally have someone involved. So now we have a guy. Um, That's but, great. Yeah. So what land does the North Fork Audubon Society have? Good question. We're, um, we're actually stewards of Inlet Pond County Park. So mm -hmm. we're, we are there um, at the... Yeah, because of the county, um, we so we don't own the Royal Laysan Nature Center. We we rent it for whatever a dollar. Whatever. We mm -hmm. rent it, and we have a contract with the county to maintain the Royal Laysan Nature Center and to maintain the 55 acres of trails wow. and woods there. And it's a fantastic preserve. But over the years, it was originally a farm, and over the years, it has become like so many properties here on the on the North Fork and, and all over, it's become just full of invasives. And in the, in the case of in the Palm Park in particular, Privet, um, which just, you know, if, if uh, not maintained like it is on the South Fork and neat hedges, you know, mm -hmm. it'll just grow wild and it takes over everything. And also like Oriental Bittersweet, which looks very pretty, but it will just strangle the trees, literally take the trees right down and over time and things like mile a minute and I could go on and on um, invasive. So I think the county is very happy and should be very happy because mm -hmm. we have really made an effort, thanks to some of our uh, board members and our landscape committee and our um, and, and our Teresa Dilworth in particular, who, who maintains our trails. She has been out there. I think they've taken down something like 12,000 privets over the past few years and they are out there all the time and we're always looking for volunteers to help us by the way out <laughs> on the trails like just um you know cutting back on these inv invasives mm -hmm. so the birds can come back yeah. how does some of these invasive species get within the park area how do they get a, you know could be from birds from dropping birds. the you know <laughs> they're all they're everywhere not just mm -hmm. in our park mm -hmm. they're everywhere but we we just made an effort to like we've just made it our mission and I mean it's one of the things that we try to educate people we're all about our mission is to connect people with nature mm -hmm. that's our mission so one of the ways to connect people with nature is to to help people see how they can make a difference in their own backyards so just mm -hmm. get rid of the, if you have invasives in your backyard plant native trees and mm -hmm. native plants that are better for birds and, and insects, which are vital for you know our whole ecosystem. Um, so we we try. So we have some. This being said, we have some wonderful demonstration gardens there um, on the property. Um, we have our native songscape uh, um, garden, which is is basically just native plants um, and and grasses, native grasses that the birds can eat and they keep mm -hmm. the invasives away. And, and with that's been, I guess this is maybe our fourth year with that. And it's doing fantastic. It's to the, just to the West as you're facing the, the building. And then we have a rain garden right in front of the building. It's showing mm -hmm. people how they can, you can plant a rain garden in your yard and you never need to worry about watering mm -hmm. it if you set it up correctly. And that's thriving. Again, all with native plants. And then we're very excited about our latest project, which is berries for birds. And um, this was started with um, seed money from the late Rick Kettenberg, who was a devoted board member, and he was a licensed wildlife rehabilitator who passed away this year. And he um, gave us some money to start this garden that we've named Rick's Toey's Garden after him because he loves <laughs> Toey's. Um, and it's all about burying shrubs for birds, planting shrubs that, uh, because, you know, people think, oh, well, birds like this and that fruit, you know, like Oriental bittersweet. Yes, they'll eat it, but it doesn't ripen at the right time of year where it's, it has nutritional value for the birds. So mm -hmm. you you want to plant things that are good for the birds and that are also beautiful to look at. And it's amazing when, you know, you plant things like that, you see all of a sudden you see like butterflies and insects that, <laughs> you know, probably didn't have before. So we, we that is just underway. We've just put up the deer fence. You'll see a structure there on the North Road. That's our, the deer fence. Again, we want to show that a deer fencing is necessary, unfortunately, um, but that also it can be very beautiful. It doesn't have to be, you know, clumsy and, and, and ugly. But so we're, we're going to be planting that garden in the spring. We've been preparing the soil and that will be a, a 2024 project for us and beyond. Wow. And I've actually been on the, the trails in Inlet Pond uh -huh. um, and it's really a unique environment because you get a different from the cliff area and then you can go down mm -hmm. to the beach and then you see the pond and you kind of get a variety it's i can see why this area was preserved 
uh-huh. when it was, because mm-hmm. it was a unique environment. And, and that wonderful stretch of Sound Beach. Yes, too. definitely. Yeah. We get many visitors to the park, like Mm -hmm. many visitors, and we've really improved our signage. Um, So again, like I say, the county should be very happy. (laughs) Really, (laughs) we really, and we keep in close contact with the county. You know, anytime Mm -hmm. we make a change, obviously we have to let them know. I mean, they're very, very particular. We have to tell them like what invasives we're removing, and if we're planting Mm -hmm. anything new, exactly what we're planting. They, you know, they're they're on it. You know, but um, but so far, you know, everything's. (laughs) Everything's going great, and we hope that will continue. But it is a very, very special place that is beloved by by many people. And, of course, yes, there's the tick problem, as there is everywhere. But one of the things Mm -hmm. about the work that we've done to clear the trails and make them more open is obviously to to cut down on the the tick population. Definitely. It's it's a problem all over. But I think you even mentioned having the deer fence Mm -hmm. fencing. That might help as well. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, I mean the the shrubs wouldn't survive if the deer, you know, most likely if yes. the deer could get at them. Unfortunately. And yeah. do you have any future expansions or yes. other conservation efforts? Yeah, well, you know, continuing um, those demonstration projects, obviously continuing the work of invasive invasive species removal, but also, um, you know, we have our uh, summer nature camp that we've been doing the past few years, so we'll continue that. We offer scholarships. Um, you know, we want to really get kids involved. I mean, that's mm-hmm. one of our big, big um, initiatives for 2024 is to, like, connect children with nature. So we have our Young Birders Club, which meets year-round periodically, um, and the nature camp. And then, of course, we do just our regular, um, just to raise awareness in general, we do uh, our bird walks uh, first Friday of every month. We invite guest birders to come, and we do and we do these all over. We don't just do these at Inland Palm Park. We do this at nature preserves all over the North mm-hmm. Fork, um, which is really fun. So we get you know different times of year. We go to different places, and um, and to see through the eyes of our there's so many talented guest birders out mm-hmm. here. Um, so we try to you know mix that up, and and everyone loves those walks. And then we have Tuesdays with Tom. Tom Damiani has been involved with our organization for 30 years now. Um, he's a, a expert birder, and um, he was on our board, and um, he's volunteered for years. And um, he leads walks on the uh, once a month on the third Tuesday, and he's going to start a beginning birders. Uh, workshop this winter for people who just like have no idea and they want to mm-hmm. get into it but they don't know how to use the binoculars or anything so yes. um, that kind of thing um, and then we just we have all kinds of um, programs both live and zoom and educational mm-hmm. programs that we do you know at least monthly we'll have a live or or, or a zoom program um, at different locations quite often at at, um, at the Roy Latham Nature Center um, and just the other thing the other long-term dream that I have for the organization um, is that after Rick died, we don't have a licensed wildlife rehabilitator on the North Mm -hmm. Fork. And I get called because I get the calls that come in for Audubon. And people call, especially, you know, in the springtime when so many birds are nesting, people call about an injured bird or a bird fell out of the nest Mm -hmm. or uh, injured animals. And I always have to refer them to the Evelyn Alexander Wildlife Rescue, which is in Hampton Bays, which is the closest rescue and they they are inundated um they are a volunteer organization well they have staff as well but they have volunteers that um will you know come and get the animals but you know if you're in orient and you've got an injured animal and they're Mm -hmm. 45 minutes away and they can't get there right away so what i my dream is to to be able to offer that service somehow in the north fork whether Mm -hmm. it's i don't know a mobile unit um you know some way that when people call that we can you know, we can help that because it's the animal, obviously, that suffers yes. in the end if, if we can't get help for that animal. Or, you know, it could be, you know, turtles, fish, birds. Um, we get and, all kinds of calls. And it's far to coming and from Hampton Bays. Yeah. I mean, like for turtles, there's the Turtle Rescue of the Hamptons. There's AMCs. For, you know, there's other organizations. But and, and more especially like birds and, and mammals, there isn't really a local organization that, that mm-hmm. has been able to help them. So that's sort of a long-term goal for me. And then just the ongoing, as I mentioned before, um, teaching and helping and encouraging people to plant native plants and that they can do this in their own backyard, that mm-hmm. it starts in your own backyard. And and then once you have that awareness, and I, you know, I've 
we've switched over. We only plant native plants now in our yard. And it just, the difference that I see just in, in my own backyard, mm-hmm. I know it will be inspiring to other people if they, if they get on board with this idea. So we're, we're there to help. We have our native plant sale mm-hmm. in the spring and the fall, which is also a fundraiser for us. But, um, you know, we love the native plant sale because we're, we're selling people what, you know, mm-hmm. what will help them t- to achieve that mission. Definitely. And was there anything else that you hope for the future of North Fork as a whole, as well as the Audubon Society? Mm -hmm. Um, I guess my wish for the North Fork is very much aligned with my wish for North Fork (laughs) Audubon, you know, which is that people continue to appreciate the wealth of natural preserves we have here. You know, wherever you live on the North Fork, you're you're probably less than five minutes from a mm-hmm. preserve that you could go or a beach or someplace where you could go and observe nature and I think that the more people get away from their cell phones and mm. their laptops and 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 get out there just get out there and and go enjoy the water enjoy the woods get out there and connect with nature then that's going to be our mm-hmm. that's going to help save the north fork from development in the future so it's all about you know protecting what we have and, mm-hmm. and make and, and continuing to make it accessible and making sure that our younger generation appreciates it as well mm-hmm. and because they're going to be the future stewards. And I, I feel like I even would just sometimes when you're living in a place for a long time, you can kind of take it for granted, just mm-hmm. seeing the how close the water is where other mm-hmm. people would just enjoy that or they drive hours to get to a coastline mm-hmm. and yeah. just appreciating that. And I think, like you said, making sure we we keep the area as natural as we can and hopefully we don't overdevelop like western long island Mm -hmm. where it just everything looks the same and Mm -hmm. we have unique nature out here and unique architecture i think yeah it's definitely and our water is clean too you know that our water is clean let's just you know (laughs) we gotta do everything (laughs) we can to take care of that as well definitely I want to thank you so much for coming on today. And it was really interesting hearing everything you had to say from the North Fork wineries to everything going on at the North Fork Audubon Society. So thank you very much. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Christopher. Well, I hope you all enjoyed episode six with Peggy Lauber. And thank you again for listening to the Floyd Memorial Library podcast. And we'll see you next week.